Okay, welcome and good morning to everyone. Um, thanks very much for choosing to be here. Thanks to all those who have made the event possible, the technicians, thanks to the interpreters who are increasing the accessibility of this event, and welcome to those of you who are joining us online later. This sector is full of people who tell stories, who use them to connect causes and inspire action. So why then am I here to talk to you about these things? Especially, and I'll admit it now, that I was a, tw I was a lawyer for 20 years. Please don't hold this against me. Mm. Um, a commercial lawyer, a civil litigator. Some might say the definition of an evil storyteller. But being a lawyer meant that I saw what the results were of bad storytelling, what the results were of bad communication. And there was always a moment when we were preparing a case where we would look back and we would say, if only someone had heard that earlier, if so, only someone had connected and listened earlier, then this whole contention would never have happened. So that started developing my passion and understanding how we can make communication better in the first place, rather than when it was too late. But also I'm someone who's interested in communication because my hearing loss, my very, very partial hearing loss, was only diagnosed when I was in my 40s, lifelong hearing loss. And I realised that in many of the situations where I struggled to understand people wasn't actually my fault. But there was also something about how we could improve ways that people could connect and understand. And people needed to work to be able to do this. We needed to understand the process of communication. But also I think it honed a lot of my skills in understanding that communication is much more than people listening to words. It's about body language, it's about emotions, it's about so much more about what it means to be a human and connect. But I've also been a lifelong bookworm. You know, I think my mum would always say she could find me anywhere, anywhere, it was my nose buried in a book. What is it that I loved about stories? I think it was the people, it was the connection, it was the learning. And I'm so excited now that I work in a context where I can use all these things, my love of stories, my care about communication, in order to help people now to communicate effectively. It led to the founding of my own communications consultancy about eight years ago, Heart and Mouth, where I like working with people to enable them to express what's in their heart in their mouth, or on X, or on Facebook, or in any other context in which they choose to connect with people. How do you help make the messages that matter be understood, heard, and shared? There's so much that I could talk about this, but we have an hour, so I'm going to try and limit it to the context of which I think you've come to share today about, which is about stories. It's understanding about why do we talk about stories so much in this sector? How do we actually find these stories? Who then listens to these stories and how do we make them heard? But hopefully some practical tips as well for yourselves. But how do you share that story? Today is not just about me talking at you. It's also about you thinking about how you talk and how you connect. And so there's no better way than to get you going from the start. Don't worry, I'm not gonna ask you to stand up and do a presentation. I am gonna ask you to turn around and speak to your neighbor and very quickly just ask them, what's your favorite story? Your favorite book, your favorite film, your favorite box set, favorite TV program, even for your favorite song. Just give you 30 or so seconds just to share your favorite story with your neighbor. Mm. Your favourite song. <laughs> <laughs> I think I always, I, I love anything that tells stories. You know, so I don't know. What about you? What's your favourite one? Me. Um, there's a song that I can't get out of my head by Pete with uh -huh. Strangers, and there's just some beautiful, beautiful lines in it, and it makes me cry. Every time I listen to it, 
and it, I mean, it, it wouldn't have affected, and I know it wouldn't have affected me the same way when I was a young man. Oh, it's just all your mega life experience in the lens, yeah. So it's hit, it's resonated with me. Brilliant, and, and that's what the song is as old as me, mm. and oh. that's what I that's what I love about it's it. Lovely. And it's really interesting for me what people gravitate to. Yeah. So for me, it's films and books. I'll talk about that. So, and I change my mind every time because I've got so many favourites. Can I also just say thank you? Your presentation is so clear, and I'm really enjoying the fact that I've, I've, honest, I've struggled with kind of the nebulous, kind of waffly stuff. This is on the money, Aww. and it's, it's honestly, I'm really enjoying it. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. I might not let me have a go. <laughs> okay, okay, and this is the danger of this sector, isn't it? Don't worry, you're going to get a chance to speak to each other in a wee while. Listen to the buzz in the room. Listen to what happens when we start talking about stories. Some of you are going instantly go into books, to films. You, you all choose different things. And it's probably highly unlikely that you chose the same story as the person next to us. So there's this instinctive thing that we know what a story is. But actually, how do we define a story? How do we use that effectively? What is a story? We all mean different things. You all had different answers, don't we? And to help us understand that, we can think about the story of the six blind men who were asked to describe an elephant. They all had different answers. The one that felt the tusks, it's a spear. The one that felt the ears, it's a fan, the wall, a rope for the tail, a tree for the legs, a snake for the, I can't even remember what the snake is, the trunk, that's it. <laughs> Very big snake, isn't it? All of them were right. From their perspective, all of them were right. And none of you were wrong about what your favourite story was. The difficulty sometimes is that within this sector, we're asked to do storytelling and we don't necessarily know what that is. So we're going to take the chance to step back and to see the whole elephant and to start breaking down some of what that is. Because in some ways, it's incredibly easy. You easily came up with stories, but in other ways, it's very difficult to do. Is there a story formula? Well, in essence, there is. A story is something that we as humans have been hardwired to hear, share, and listen to. A story is something that blends personal experience, emotions, and information. It is a unique communication channel that works so well and effectively. It is personal because it is a people business. There are studies about how our brains work to do this. It is emotional because it engages our hearts, but it's also information because it delivers stuff to our brain, stuff that we can understand, repeat, and use as we move, for, move forward. You are already storytellers, and you are already storytellers in the context of the organization that you work with. And to prove that, you're going to share a story now not at the end of this workshop, now. And I'm going to give you five minutes and a prompt to do this. You're going to turn around to your neighbours and you're going to share this. What your name is and your connection to the charity that you're here with. That could be trustee, volunteer, staff member, it could be anything. What's the one thing that you love about that charity? And what's the difference that that thing makes? I'm going to give you five minutes to do this. So that's essentially two, if you're in pairs, two and a half minutes each. And I'll give a, a halfway warning when we're doing that. So prove to yourselves that you are storytellers about the people that you work with. And your five minutes starts now. I don't want you to I'm saying it to all the speakers, because there are times I'm kind of laughing. So it makes me, yeah, and, and partly what I do is I work with people on presentation skills. And you see, they're just reading. What do you think your mouth is? Why have I paid 200 quid to come here? You know, next time, just send it in an email and I'll read it myself with my own. You know, 
funny because they asked for speaker notes, obviously for accessibility, and I'm like, I don't want to speak for speaker no, notes. No, it's it's I can, I can listen to what you're saying, make sense of it, process it, and present it into another language. It's not that hard. I wonder how much of me doing that is because of my business. I think it is. Mm. And I think it's important. I've now, I, I kind of smiled in when you mentioned him and said, oh, it's, you get it. <laughs> <laughs> it's very mine. People say, oh, you did. I'm like, I, because I've done some work within the deaf I'm like, I'm so not. I, I, I wouldn't even begin to sure. describe myself as yeah. that. But I have hearing loss. There's enough of I think you have an empathy. Yeah, maybe that's it. Yeah, yeah. Not, not the same. It's like, it's like I've been married to a Punjabi for 25 years. It doesn't make me an expert. <laughs> I'm an expert on her. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the me. okay, that's halfway through your time. Halfway through. Mm. Yeah, there's nothing, there's nothing worse than somebody claims to be... Imagine me talking about women's issues. Oh, my mum's a woman, my wife was, I've got a couple of daughters, so I know. Yeah, <laughs> check, don't, check it, just you don't. know. Yeah. You, you either lived it or you haven't. And what got you into signing? Deaf family. But I had a road to Damascus moment in my uh, mid-twenties. I left home at 15 and did lots of different things, but... Um, but yeah, in the mid twenties, I got involved with the deaf community, and yeah, I, don't ask me to put a shelf up. I'm used to it. I can do this. <laughs> oh, it's such a skill. My husband got level one um, oh, yeah. signing years and years ago, and it's, it's fast. It, it is fast. But he, he jokes that he then did a piece because it was to do access to law. He's a lawyer as well. And then he did a piece on the radio about access to deaf justice, and we're like, <laughs> on the radio. that's not really very effective. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. At least it got it talked about. I have, I have heard deaf people interviewed on the radio. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. They're using interpreters. It just makes it work. I'm sorry. I don't want to keep you from. No, no, I'm just going to keep an eye on my time. Yeah. Mm. Okay, about 30 seconds left. Mm. Okay, I'm going to ask you to start winding up your stories now. Mm. Okay. And I'm going to do that five, four, three, two, one. Thank you. Thank you. Hands up if you enjoyed listening to the stories. Yeah, excellent. Hands up if you learned something from listening to the story. Right, so we can just go now, can we? <laughs> we can do it already. That's the point of stories. And stories are within, but it's understanding how we can bring them without, understanding the tools at our disposal to take this incredibly natural instinct to share emotions, to share information, and do it in a way that connects with people. You've all just done it. But partly understanding, pulling back the layers of something that we do instinctively, I think, and in my experience of working with many charities, means that we can start doing it more consciously and therefore more effectively and ultimately more authentically. What enabled you to do that storytelling there was that you were given a structure. You were given an audience. And so knowing that, understanding the structure, the basis of these things is important. And very often when we talk about storytelling, that's what we focus on. But for me, understanding the process of storytelling 
is unfortunately a bit more complicated than that. Yes, we could spend the rest of this session talking about the journey metaphor, talking about your beginnings and your middles and your ends. But in my experience, pulling back the layers to start, not just from the how you do this, but where these stories come from is important, and also understanding why we are telling the story. And I think when it comes to thinking about our storytelling, I'd invite you, as you work with people, if you work with your organisations, as you tell your own story, to always start with the why. Why do we tell stories? Well, like stories themselves, there's a million and one different reasons for that. But I think it's useful to think in the context that we operate in about three different reasons that we share stories. Love, lens and lessons. A picture of Bagpus up there because I love Bagpus stories. And I love them because my gran used to tell me them. I used to curry into her, listen to them before bedtime. I was devastated when I discovered that the whole world knew Bagpus stories on the television. You know, I was like, oh, how did gran get on TV? And then I told Bagpus stories to my children. We tell stories because they bring communities together. They create a connection. They enforce love. What better reason sometimes can there be for telling stories in the context of an organisation or within a sector that is prepared to put love at the front of things? But that's not the only reason that we share, share stories. I've got a picture of the Spider-Man lens up there because, um, well, I love a bit of Marvel. Often when I answer my favourite film, there's a Marvel film there too. But it's partly because stories allow us to look at the same set of facts from different lenses. So think about the Spider-Man lens, how many different kinds of Spider-Men there have been, or Batman, or whatever, whatever, Wonder Woman, let's come up with the female version, yeah. And, and think about how that frames experience. What difference does it make if Spider-Man is actually 15, or it really is 30? What difference if his aunt has got grey hair and is 90, and is, uh, and, um, or if she's relatively young, and I still think 50 is young, please. Yeah. It allows us to look at that and consider alternatives to offer different framings and different potentials. When it comes to influencing through our storytelling, using it with, to tell different lenses is a really effective way of doing it. But we also use storytelling to tell lessons. There is a reason that so many fairy tales are about going into the woods. And that's because of the time that they were happening, forests were dark and dangerous places to go into. Now, I don't know about those of you who have children, but if I said to my kids, don't go in the woods, we can be pretty guaranteed the first thing they would do is go into the woods. So you tell let thing, stories in order to make them sound attractive, in order to engender some of that sense of fear that might have stopped them going into the woods and to share the information. Woods are scary. Hansel and Gretel, Little Red Riding Hood. Woods are scary places. Think before you go in. They inspire action as well as informing. How often do you pause and reflect when someone says, I need a story to ask, why? What is the purpose of this story? And how do we frame this story around that? So that's the first thing that I would like you really to take away from that, is that pause before you even find a story to think, why am I looking at this story? And what purpose are we using it for? But then, of course, the issue becomes, how do you find a story? How do you find that needle in a haystack sometimes when people are running around, flapping around, we need a story, we want to do this? Sometimes, of course, the haystack is that there's too many stories. How do we know there's the right ones? And it's partly knowing where to look and partly knowing what some of the dangers and what some of the implications might be of looking for these stories. Third sector organisations often find their stories in the lone voice. Someone who has seen something, someone who recognises an issue, recognises an opportunity, recognises a need, and they have found a fix for it. And very often our um, objective 
in strategic storytelling is to amplify that voice, is to give this poor man a slightly larger amp than the one that he has, so that people don't just walk on by, but will listen. How often do you want people to stop and listen to a particular story? What, what equipment do you give to that individual to tell their story, to hear their story, to ensure people don't walk on by and to understand the issue, understand the theme and understand the heart of their song or their story? Take time to listen to the lone voices in your organisation and consider how you can amplify that to let people hear. Take time to listen. Stop. Don't walk on by and think how you can work with them to let them be amplified. Powerful stories are shared that way. Transformative stories are shared that way, but they are found by stopping and listening. But in my experience, very often the most impactful stories are the ones that are blends of many voices. Think what difference it would have made in that corner of Buchanan Street if it wasn't just one individual standing singing, but instead it was this choir with the band beside them. There's something about a story that is shared, that is collective, that more and more people join in. That's where the sweet spot of stories come. We can hear the themes that people are sharing. And how that impacts on other people is that it doesn't just need to be the one story that is shared. Think about the difference of uh, this, this choir sang one tune and one note all together. It would be loud and a lot of people would hear it. But it will be remembered, it will be noticed if you've got lots of different parts. The richness of harmony. That's what stories can do. Bring a blend, bring a harmony. But that is sometimes hard, harder to do which is very often why we rely on the lone voice. It's easier to control one story. What do we do if someone starts singing off key? So working with your team, working with your organisation, thinking how do we blend these voices so people feel that they are still singing their song, but they're singing it not necessarily in unison, but in harmony with each other. That requires a process of looking at themes, of listening, at encouraging people to understand why they are singing together and not on their own. After all, who wants to be in Take That if you can be Robbie Williams? That's a process, and I'm going to unpack in a short time about how you can do it, because that is a difficult process. But I'd encourage you to have the courage to look for the shared story, look for these themes, because that can then be repeated and it could be the, begin to be the dream. This is a picture, if you can recognize it, maybe some of you were there, of Lewis Capaldi at the Glastonbury Festival. And I'm sure you know this, that you know, his voice failed, his courage failed, but it wasn't a failure. Because what happened is other people knew his song, other people knew the words, and the choir, start, the, the choir of the audience started singing. And it became a beautiful moment. That's where stories can be really beautiful. You no longer need to sing them yourselves. That other people know this story, other people know the words, they know the themes, they can sing it in their own voices, and they will take your message wider. So when you're telling your story, think of the potential. Someone will not just stop and listen on the corner of Buchanan Street. Someone will learn the tune, someone will take note of the lyrics, and they'll start singing it and they'll start sharing it. That is where the sweet spot will be. Of course, there's loads and loads of different places to, to find stories. There's a couple of things that I'd like you to think about and consider, though, when you are in story seeker mode. One thing to consider is the founder story and the power of the founder story. Lots and lots of charities are found by one visionary person. You know, and, and that can be a tale of tragedy, from perhaps a loss of a family member. It can be a tale of opportunity. I happened to be standing at a bus stop and I started speaking to a woman. Or it could be any of these things. And founders have that drive, they have that vision. And very often we encourage, and we are right to encourage founders to share their stories. Many charities have amazing founder stories. They can be crafted, they can be considered, and they can pull people 
towards that message. However, what I would also ask you to start thinking about is how much of this is about one person and how hard is it for anyone else to pretend to be Taylor Swift. Now, I come from a Swifty household, so obviously there is no other Taylor Swift. Mm. But the danger is that um, in a charity is that it all goes on one person's shoulders. And the impact of that is that we no longer hear the theme, we no longer hear the information, we just hear, see the person. And what that can sometimes end up in charities that I've worked with is that people feel then reluctant to share a story because it's not their story. How, how can I talk about this individual? Because that's the dead son of the founder. How can I talk about what it is like to meet Jeannie in that bus stop 20 years ago? Because I wasn't even born 20 years ago. Mm. So be aware, value, don't throw babies out with bathwater. Understand your founder story. Think about, I mean, think about how marvelous and wonderful and amazing, these are the words that are used about Swift Taylor in our household, amazingly are. But think about how you can empower them to empower other people. And so that you don't just have one stadium full, you have many, many stadiums. There's work that can be done, there's effort you can do, and it's encouraging people that they too can sing that song in their own voices. Another thing to be cautious about when it comes to storytelling, um, I needed to get a bit of musical theatre, sorry about the blurry picture, but Oliver, who will buy, I'm really about to burst into song, song so please stop me, who will buy this wonderful story? How many times do you feel that you've been selling stories? How many times do you feel that there might be a slightly extractive process in tell me your story and we can use that. We can use it for a funding application. We can use that in order to get that um, individual on board. We can use that to make people realize how awful life is because we're gonna tell how awful this person's life is. That is not to say not to share the stories, but it's be loyal as to why you're sharing the stories. Think about that emotional, personal impact. Be alive and cautious to this. And think, start thinking about what your ethical storytelling process is. Sort of things to start thinking about, key signs is, is this story authentic or has it been made to fit the funding application that we are going for? That should be an alarm bell. Start thinking about if the sharing of that story has been fully consented to. When you say to that individual, I'm just gonna note down some of what your quotes are saying, is that okay, we might use it later. Is that really full consent for you then to be standing on a stage or putting it all over social media? Talk to people about how you value their story. Make them understand what the context is in which you might use it. Experience very often is that people are desperate for their stories to be heard. But again, if we remember that form, that they are personal. They are and will always remain that individual's property. And so respect it as that, even if you have it noted down in your files. For me though, the key warning is this. Do you talk about case study or do you talk about story? Now, those of you that know me will know that I have a particular aversion to the phrase case study. I do understand that many funders will actually say, give us a case study, and it is a term of art. And in some situations, that is the exactly right thing to be aware of. Case study as a phrase comes from situations just as that. They look at case and we study it to learn it. We almost deliberately take the emotion out of it in order to take the learnings from it. That is sometimes the right thing to do. I hope you appreciate how hard it took to get um, a medical image of this age with all women in it. But um, um, Story is an exchange of personal property. It is their narrative, it is their emotions, and it is their memory. So start thinking, what is your ethical storytelling process? Are we studying it? Are we valuing all that blends in to make a story the unique thing it is? The good news is that there is a way of doing this though, and I've been lucky enough to do this with a number of organizations, and I thought I'd just quickly share with you um, 
a, a, a design process that you might think about when it comes to story finding by design. Um, it is obviously inspired by whisky, um, our national drink, and it came to me when I was standing in Isla looking at the mash tun going through the distillery, um, that this is exactly the process that we use when it comes to story finding by design. Let me explain what I mean by this and justify my position. For me, a lot of it is that preparation, thinking, how do we get this up and running? What space are we opening up for this? What creative prompts are we giving to bring this, the flavours of the stories? If you ask someone, if I just said to you, tell a story, turn around to your neighbour and tell a story, there would have been silence. But you gave, I gave you a prompt earlier. Talk about what you love, talk about what you do. This. So start thinking what kind of story, and, and that can be really creative and enjoyable, and I'll give an example of that later. Then think about that big mash tun, which is quite stinky, if any of you have been in a, a distillery, about how all voices are valued, all voices need to be heard, particularly if you're telling an organisational story. And then the fermenting process, that's where the magic happens where you take the time and the patience to hear the themes. Remember we talked about that choir. Patience is what it takes. Um, it's not something that can be done overnight if you are valuing how you're doing it. And really listen to what's bubbling up to the top. And accept in the distillation process that not all ideas will end up in the final story, but be able to sense check if they link in. You know, if you've got a nose for whiskey, which I don't, but you can so f smell the seaweed, smell the peat, smell the stones. The distillation process still has that in there, even though you're not actually drinking seaweed, stones and peat. You know, so trust that process. And then take the time, if you've gone through this process, to think what barrel are you putting it in? You know, whiskey depends on whether it's a port barrel or bourbon barrel, all that, that flavours it in. So am I putting this in social media? Am I putting it on my website? Am I putting it in my presentation kit? How, where, how am I packaging that story? And how is it best told in the package that I'm giving it in? And then ultimately bottle, label and market it properly. These are the stories that we hear. This is what lies at our heart. I am telling you this story because I want you to think about what change you can make. I am telling you this story so that you can feel love. I am telling you this story so that you can learn something about how change is possible. I'm very quickly going to show you an example of, um, I talk about how time, this is a, a two year story, two and a half year story to, told in a couple of minutes in three slides about what this can look like. A number of years ago, I was approached by Harmony Education Trust, which is an amazing um, facility very close to where I live in Bellerno, just in the hills of, um, in the Pentland Hills, which provides care and residential um, opportunities to young people who have been impacted by trauma and adversity in their life. They initially um, approached me to try and consider how they share their story. Um, this is how they were at that stage facing the outside world. Uh, a yellow house, which was based on the white house that was at the centre of their grounds, and a quite confusing um, website, which had no storytelling in it. Now, bless them, they didn't realise that they were actually asking for a rebranding and website project, but hey, guess what happened? Um, but it started with storytelling, that initial preparation stage. And this is how we did it. This is we unlocking the stories. Picture there of my secret weapon, which is my dog. Buna, Buna having whiskey, not the curry. Um, and we started listening to the stories with the children, the children that live in that space. And I took Buna up and I said to them, we want to tell other people about um, what's going on um, in Harmony. Of course, the kids were like, whoa. I said, can you show Buna what you want? What, where would you like to show her in this estate? So they loved that, it was great, she's a great dog. Um, not one of these children talked about the White House at the centre, the White House that featured so carefully on that brand. Not one of them showed Bina that house. None of them told a story of that house. So we listened to the story, listened to what they said, and then we spoke with the teams. This is all done during lockdown, so this is all done online, and we used a series of, story, uh, of pictures to see what do you talk about when you talk about harmony? These were the top five pictures that were picked from all the sessions that we did online. 
Um, and that's where we started forming the story. They told a story of messy creativity, but where it wasn't about being in niche boxes, but being able to blend the colours together. They talked about love in a corporate parenting context. They talked about children being seen as unique, as that umbrella, that individual, not just as a black umbrella, but as a person. They talked about the space of their estate, of the trees, of the adventure, of the nature that was able to sustain and nourish and allow these children to thrive as they so richly deserve to do. They talked most, this is the, the bottom right one was the most important picture, it was picked nearly by everyone. They talked about the messy compost of holding that, of giving hope, of giving nourishment and, and giving it that blend and sucker which was so beautiful and individual to harmony. None of them spoke of a yellow house. And so two years later, thanks to um, the, the amazing stories that we're telling and the fermenting and the blending and all that process, we jumped forward to a launch of a new brand and a launch of a new website. Um, and I want to acknowledge Day6, who helped us with the brand and website um, development and helped us tell the story. But show you a video. I'm really proud of this. I know the young person that narrates this. Um, and I'm so proud of her. Um, and this is how we tell the Harmony story now. H is for home, passing potential, horizons, happiness, hope, healing. H is for Harmony! Didn't she do well? Mm. Mm. I had this up just in case the video didn't work. The, the logo and the branding wasn't about the logo and the branding. It was about how we share the story. But I'm hoping you can see what I mean by the whiskey process there. That the space that we talked about, the trees, the hope, the light, are all incorporated in there. And it allows us to share and tell the story. This is the new website that's been developed. It's much more child focused. We've got a whole section about their journey and it's about people and it's about smiles and it's the story. And we're consistent, not just in the colors, but in how we share that story. We bottled it and we hope that we are marketing it in a way that the key people that need to engage in this are able to engage in it. So what I'm going to give you, and I should say at the end, that if you want the slides, um, please sign up. I'm more than happy to share slides from this, is maybe take this away to your organisations and start thinking about what your chemical process is for developing stories. Who do you listen to in your organisation? Is it the lone voice? Is it the founder? Listening to them all is what helps. What spaces and places do you create? Creation is really important. Remember, this is a creative process. And how do you share the themes your people tell? And where do you value your product? All really important pro um, prompts. And I hope it might be something that you can take back to your organizations and think and reflect on together and continuing to share, tell the stories. But of course, that's only part of the storytelling process. You all listened to stories earlier. And part of this process is why are you telling the stories? How do you find the stories? But it's also critical to think about who hears our stories and how do we engage in them. The audience is really critical to think about. We can often fear the audience response. This is what I imagined you might look like during the course of this talk. And how can they possibly say that? Because some of us have had experiences of this. We've told stories and people have like, reacted in horror and rejection. So we want to think about how we deal with that. More problematically, I think, in this organization, is the, in this sector, is this response, is that people don't even bother to listen. They turn their back. How do we convince them to turn around and listen to the stories that we worked so hard to find and to think and to blend and distill and to process. And again, another fear for today. How, <laughs> how do we um, do it in a way that we ensure that we don't bore our audience? And let's be honest, sometimes some stories are told so often that, oh, here they go again. 
another story about this. Oh, yeah, Jimmy was. Flora this. Oh, yeah. You know, there's no point denying that that reaction happens. And we have to deal with it and we have to process and we have to think about it. And stories are the way that we can hook into people and make them listen. But we make them listen. A few tips in a moment about who them is. Sometimes we think that this is the point of the stories, and if this is a cue for what you're going to do at the end, you know, take it as a subliminal image. Uh, um, but there's something, I think, when you're thinking about strategic storytelling, that actually, as nice as it is to get, is it that initial, that was fab, mate? Is that what you're really wanting to tend, spend all this distilling process on, just for people to go, that was great? What I'd encourage you to think about is a longer life for the stories that you've taken the time to blend and to bottle and to market. Think about the stories that will actually make people listen, that will start making them learn, start making them to engage in the things that you want to. We're back to the why. Why are you wanting this audience to listen? Starting with your why and then going back to their why is really important. Because again, remembering the result is that we want them to share the stories. We want to engage, we want to listen, and we want to respond. We want people to think, well, that's interesting because I felt this, or I learned this, or I empathise with this, or I didn't. I was moved to action or I wasn't. Let me unpick the story and understand why. And there's lots of ways that you can do this. And again, it's about taking the time to think about your audience's perspective so that they will hear, connect, and share with your story. One of the exercises that I find often works most interestingly with clients is the audience mapping exercise and starting with who you're trying to tell the story to. And what we'll do is we'll sit down and we'll ask these questions. It looks a bit weird, isn't it? The first two is who are they? The first one is who are they? And very often I ask, how old are they? And it's encouraging people to think about the people that you want to share stories with are people. So if you're sharing stories with a funder, you're not sharing it with a funding organization, you're sharing it with an individual who's going to be reading your application form. If you're sharing a story in a Scottish government representation panel, you're not sharing it with SG. You're maybe sharing it with Hamza, who is an individual who is a father, who's recently gone through trauma. What does that mean for the stories that you're trying to connect with there? Think about where you find them, because we find people in different places. Stories are told in different ways in different places to meet the audience. If you watched Into the Woods, the Sondheim musical, it's very different than how I told Little Red Riding Hood to my two-year-old. It's very different. There's the, what's the Descendants on Disney. That's a very different way of framing the story as well. Think about where you're going to meet them and tailor the story for where you meet them and how you meet them. And that could mean things like your social media. It could mean it in your presentations, in your talks, in your chats, in the queue at ASDA. What do you do? I work for a charity. Oh, what do they do? That's a particular place. Think about why they're there. If they're in the queue for ASDA, they're not there to get a half-hour presentation about what the amazing things, but they might be there about, oh, that's interesting. I've learned something in that moment. Mm -hmm. Quick stories. But then the key questions I'd encourage you to unpack is what do your audience expect to hear from you? It might not necessarily be the same as you actually are giving them. But think, what do they expect? And that is different from the next two questions. What do they want and what do they need? They might want to be told how to spend money. They might want to be told... Um, that um, there's an easy solution to fix this. But they might need to know there's not. They might need to know that partnership is the way about it. They might need to know. These are different things. And crafting your story, and you can sometimes, but you want today to get away to completely develop a story. You're not going to get that in an hour. What you need to get is understanding the framework of how story will be happening. And that's what I'm going to deliver. Crafting your story, taking the time to do that. Again, I'd encourage you to do that. That's a whole two-hour session. I hope it gives you an idea and a reminder about the importance of, of audiences. What can that look like? 
Um, I, I've worked with Social Bite for a number of years, and they have, um, and, and some of the individuals on the screen, um, I've had the privilege to work alongside as they've thought about how to craft their stories, their stories, their insights, their experience for very different audiences. I should just point out the individuals I've worked with are not Harry and Meghan, um, just in case you're wondering, um, nor unfortunately George or Leo. But how you're thinking about how you tell the social bite story, how you talk about your experience of homelessness, how it's not a lifestyle choice, um, is de depending on the different audiences, the different circumstances. When some of, um, one of the best pieces of work I ever did was with Social Bike when we were organising the Sleep in the Park. And about 20 people volunteered to share their story from the stage. I'm delighted to say that only six of them ended up sharing their story. That doesn't sound like a success story, does it? But actually it was, because 20 people were equipped with creative ways to get in touch with the story, to learn the story, be able to tell it and then were empowered to decide not to share it from the stage. The flip side of that is the six people that did knew exactly what they were doing, they knew who they were doing it to, and they knew how they were doing it, and it was a really effective way of doing it. So again, that's taking time, and we did, we, we'd literally draw audience members, no, I was going to say on the wall, don't worry, there was flip chart paper in between the wall and our Sharpie pens. But thinking about that, um, I, I, and I, I challenge you to think about, do you just tell the same story to, the, to different audiences or do you take the time um, to, to craft it towards the audience you're speaking with? That's the benefit of the distillation process because by then you know the themes you want to share. The themes will stay the same. The way in which you package them, the way in which you bottle them, will change. So take the time to do that. Meet your audience where they are. But then that gets to the question that you probably thought the whole session would be, is how do you actually do this? And there's lots of different ways. Um, and there's lots of exciting, fun ways to do it. There is, um, but I would encourage you when you're thinking about short story sh sharing within your organisations or for yourself in your own life experience, is start thinking about how much time and resource do you devote to these questions? Who do you ask to share the stories? Who do you ask to join your choir? Who do you ask to play in the, the band? I remember working with a women's aid charity and they were like, well, we can't, we can't share stories because we have an ethical policy that we don't share any of the stories of the women that we work with. Completely right ethical story. You know, that. But they didn't notice that they themselves had stories about what it's like to work in this community, what it's like to support women, what it's like to empower people, the highs, the lows and the themes. And we're able to use some of their storytelling you know, so that they lost the value in their own story and their own experience. Think about the people who've connected with you. What's it been like to support this organisation? What's it been like to give money to this organisation? What's it enabled for them? You know, look for the stories everywhere. They are everywhere. It takes time, which is our most precious resource, but very often it doesn't take that much money. And that's good news, isn't it? It's about opening up the space. Look how you're able to do it at the start. Thinking about where you share the stories is important and, and it, it ties into what I was saying about the audience mapping, that stories need to be slightly different and crafted, but if they're in person, online, through social media and events. So really think, how, how does that story narrate it? And thinking about your story skeleton, does the same story appear in every place? Is there consistency? But are you always using the same chunk? Are you always using the same wording? If you are, that's perhaps slightly alarm bells ringing and think about that. But then also think about how do you equip yourself to do this? Because the best way of sharing a story is that someone tells it. Yeah. And that's allowing people to have that shared understanding that if they are, they are part of the story. I was talking earlier about that charity where it was a founder, they, I, I can't share that story because it's not my child that died. But actually the understanding that that's not what the charity is about. The charity was about offering care in the hospital, in, well, in an out, um, out of hospital context, to be able to give safe and loving, fun places for people, and everyone was part of that. So understanding the why takes time. This personal empowerment to feel that you are part of the story, and there's nothing more empowering for the people they're part of if they've been to know that they're part of the choir. 
And there is skills training. It would be remiss of me if I didn't mention the skills training. There is a story that goes around that public speaking is feared more than death itself. There is absolutely no statistical evidence for that fact whatsoever. It's a story that people tell because it makes sense. Because people believe the information, because people think it is really scary getting up to share um, a story. The good news is that no one is born a story, a public speaker. We can develop skills in that. The leaflets that you've got handed out um, contain some of our sort of key insights into that. And please take them away. And I'm happy to um, speak with anyone about this, about what, it looks, what skills training looks like in a different context. But think about your skills training to be about equipping people to be the best versions of themselves to develop the skills that they already have. You all shared stories within five minutes of arriving here. You all shared information and everyone enjoyed listening to your stories. You can do this. So there's plenty more copies of the leaflets there, but there's some key tips there about that audience. Remember the audience mapping we're talking about? Secret weapon for any public speaking is breathe. And there's lots we can help people with about how you stand, how you breathe, how you use your body in a way to get that secret fuel. Make sure people can hear what you say. I was pretty chuffed that the previous interpreter said he could hear what I was saying, which is kind of fortunate if you're teaching presentation skills. It's a good thing to be able to be heard. Um, but again, there's lots of things we can do that. Double check. I had a moment, I think there's one person in here that I sort of glazed over about 10 to past nine this morning where I'd forgotten to double check that my slides were in place and sort of ran off like a startled bunny rabbit to do that. Check so you've got the confidence to stand up. Engage with the audience, engage with storytelling. It's right there in the centre, storytelling. Think about your structure, that structure, what's your beginning, middle, end. Be genuine. Does it come from the heart? If it doesn't come from the heart, then you're in danger of telling a case study and not a story. Mm. Think about hybrid and by hybrid is with us to stay. We're in hybrid just now. There are people watching this online. Do things like this. Look in the camera. See the difference it makes. Think about who you're engaging with, part of your audience mapping. And then think about your images. You know, as I say, you hopefully, uh, if you want, I've been seeing people taking photos, which is great. I'll give you, um, a, um, a, I'm happy to email them to you afterwards, but treat them with care. You want people to focus on the storyteller, not necessarily on the visuals behind you. Just give it a go. Sharing stories is such a privilege, it's such fun. Um, it's almost as much fun as listening to the stories. Mm -hmm. And once you start working with people, equipping them, empowering them, making them see that they are part of the story, uh, a well-told -told story looks fabulous. It looks like the people on the screen. It looks like um, people who are happy to stand up and share their story. I know all the individuals here, I've been lucky to work with all of them. And very often people will come into the room going, I've got a story, but I I'm not confident in sharing it. And there's nothing like someone walking out going, I know and I own and I can share my story. Because a story, the thumbs up, it will be liked. People will like listening to stories. It will engage them with their hearts, but it will also give them that information and it's the information that they will then be able to share other people. So a well-told told story looks like people. It feels like a connection, but it's also something that um, will be told elsewhere. It looks like something that is repeated elsewhere. Where are your well-told stories? And where, what did they make people look and feel like? Storytelling is an ancient activity. We are hardwired to do it. It's instinctive and it's human. It is the most natural way of communicating. Yet still, it is hard. Storytelling to connect and inspire requires planning. It requires understanding. It requires collaboration and it requires care. I hope you've taken many things away from this talk. We might have five minutes for questions. The one thing I would like you to take away is this framework. I'd like you to, to sit and think, this is your homework. 
Where do you find the time and space to listen to your story? What is the story that you tell yourselves as an organisation? And what of that do you want your audience to hear? And how do you help them connect with the story? Take the time to do this. Commit the resources. It's not just an, an outcome. It's a process which can inspire and can connect your team. It's really good fun. It reminds us why we're here and why we're bothering to do this at all. Um, I really hope um, that today has inspired you to think about storytelling. I hope that we can stay connected. There's sign-up sheets if you want to find out any more information about the work that we do. There's more copies of the leaflets. Please take them and with the top tips and some more information about what Heart and Mouth does. We work with the skills training. We work with facilitating these spaces to share these stories. And we work with thinking about how strategically we can communicate and connect with people. I'd be delighted to hear your story and to understand how it has inspired and connected other people. We do have five minutes, which isn't very long, um, but if anyone has any questions, the mic's there, can I really encourage you um, to speak into the mic? I think, that is, the, is there someone that could help with the mic? Take the, is anyone, or does anyone have any questions? Mm -hmm. Stunned, stunned you into silence. Oh, there's one, one question up there. Oh, thank you, David. Mm. One question. Hi, thank you for your presentation. It was I learned a lot from it. Um, my name is Rachel. Um, I work for a children's charity called Aberlower. So um, I know a lot about, um, in your presentation, you mentioned about how when you're working with like domestic abuse victims, for example, that you can't, a lot of those stories kind of struggle to be told because they have to be, um, those people are protected. That's kind of in a similar situation, but we have with a lot of kind of vulnerable children that we work with. So I just, I wondered if you had any tips or um, insights about how to make those stories powerful when you don't, you can't maybe necessarily attribute a name to a story or give away sort of, you know, in details that could bring personality to a story. Um, so I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, um, I think the great thing about storytelling rather than case studies is the joy of stories is that they don't need to be true. That sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? Um, uh, that you can, you can play, and it's back to thinking about what the themes are of these stories, and they're extremely important in contexts. Like Aberlour is very similar to the Harmony story. And um, there's some organisational things you can do. The decision obviously was taken um, when we did the rebranding there was no faces of children no identifying names, but um, being able to tell the organisational story informed by what the children, with them at the heart of everything we do. And I think that comes from any, where, where people want to protect the people at their centre, is you still listen to them. You know, and it's what we have heard is, this is how it feels to be alone. This is what it feels to not know what connection feels like when you're young. You know, and we can tell that story slightly detached um, there is a wee bit of a feast. This is Jane. She was three and her mum was horrible to her. And, you, and, and it ends up into poverty porn, which is really dangerous. But we can talk about themes. We can do it confidently. We can change names. We can change genders. That's all, although we have to be careful, obviously, because sometimes stories are gendered by necessity. Um, but you can talk about um, this is what we encounter. as an And actually, that's the power of an organisation like Aberlour is that we can't share our individual stories, we can share the themes, we can share, and so sharing themes is really important. And having the courage of pushing back when people saying we want to see a picture of these individuals and we want to see names. Stories are still true without these details necessary and have that confidence. Okay, I think we've got time for one question down here. Sorry, can I just ask you to wait for the mic? It's particularly for, thank you. Mm. Thank you for a really interesting presentation. Uh, my name's Tilly and I work at Food Train and storytelling was essential for us when we lost our funding in Glasgow earlier this year. Mm. Um, but what I wanted to say was about the platform of storytelling because sometimes various news outlets will come to us for a story and due to the nature of the people we work with, especially older people who maybe aren't necessarily willing to talk about situations of difficulty, even though there is definitely informed consent. Mm. Um, 
around how you can work with various you know they're expecting that person to tell their story but they don't necessarily want to and then they won't run a run a story or run a news piece because they don't have someone telling that story themselves and I think that can be a big challenge because we can do that in any other area of work but obviously news is still a big part of a platform to tell these stories and it's got to be a collective effort I think in terms of changing that. That's a whole other presentation, but I'm delighted you mentioned it. Yeah, um, working with news outlets is really challenging. Um, I think there's something about the courage. I mean, thinking about what the cost of your sh storytelling is. There's not, sometimes you've got managers or boards who say you have to be in the BBC, you have to be in the radio, you have to do these things. Sometimes having an ethical storytelling policy allows you to say it costs too much. So I think there's something about that. But internally, what's our cost? What's our price point there? There is about, and I can hear that you've already talked and you work with the individuals doing that. There's something about offering a range of stories and a range of lens and being able to connect your story with wider stories um, that are being told in the media. You know, so, um, I, and again, I think that's with thematic storytelling approaches really help because sometimes actually news outlets will be interested in the service provider stories provided that you can tell it in a storytelling way. Mm. So. Yeah, that's a one minute reply for an hour long session, but I hope that helped. Everyone, that's 12 o'clock. I do like to be loyal to time. Um, I'm here for a wee while afterwards. Delighted to speak to you, hear your stories. As I say, please sign up. Please take up um, more of the leaflets. And if you need the slides or any other information. Thank you so much. Mm.